Hi guys, welcome back to part two of lecture number five. We were talking about laborers organizing to defend their interests, and I want to turn now to American farmers. Why would farmers want to organize? What interests are they trying to defend? Well, if you'll recall our discussion around sharecropping in a previous lecture, we said that the economic fortunes of many farmers are declining during the late 19th century. A lot of this had to do with the fact that crop prices were sliding continuously across the board. For crops like cotton, wheat, corn, farmers were working the same amount each year, but when they went to sell their crop, they were receiving far less than they had in previous seasons. What is causing this situation? Much of it relates to the simple economic principle of supply and demand. We're seeing the supply of these crops going up and up and up each year while demand is not rising at the same time. Why do we have increasingly higher amounts of corn or wheat or rye for sale each year? There are several big forces at work, largely overproduction, domestic overproduction. Some of this has to do with improved fertilizer, meaning that crop yields are going up over time as farmers begin putting nutrients back into the soil. Some of it also has to do with new machines that are taking the place of what people used to do by hand. Now one farmer with a mechanical reaper or harvester can cultivate a thousand acres of land, whereas that would have been far too much for one farmer to have ever done by hand prior to this period. So that means that American farmers are cranking out higher and higher volumes of their crops but they're also in competition with farmers in other countries. The United States' economy is now intertwined with the global economy by the turn of the 20th century. And American farmers are not the only ones supplying the globe with wheat or cotton or insert any crop here. So the fortunes of many farmers continue to fall over time. For those that were finding themselves in debt and they were unable to pay off their debt, they're losing their land. Creditors are foreclosing on family farms. Between 1889 and 1893, for instance, over just a four-year period, creditors foreclosed on more than 11,000 farms in the state of Kansas alone. Farmers were suspicious of the railroad corporations. As the railroad industry became increasingly concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer companies, we start to see that railroad companies are charging ever higher rates for farmers to ship their goods to market. Farmers were also becoming particularly angry at the banking industry in the United States. As they, as they fell deeper into debt, many believed that there was a conspiracy among the rich and moneyed interests to charge exorbitantly high interest rates on loans to farmers. Let's put this into perspective. There was no regulation of the finance or credit industry of the United States during this era. What that means is if a farmer is desperate and they don't have good credit but they've got to take out a loan so they can buy seed for the next harvest year, then they will sometimes have to accept interest rates on that loan as high as 50 70, 100 percent interest rates on these loans. They're never going to pay off that debt. So in order to protect themselves financially, we see a grassroots agrarian movement developing among American farmers during the late 19th century. This becomes known as the populist movement or populism. It began as a local cooperative movement among farmers. Area farmers would pool their resources together to buy seed in bulk, for example, to receive a discount. Or they might pool money together among their community to purchase one piece of very expensive farm equipment, which they would then proceed to share from household to household. They might even raise funds locally to offer low interest loans to cooperative members. Yet while populism began as a sort of rural version of the labor union, it evolved into a political movement over time. Gradually, farmers will begin to realize that nothing was going to change substantially about their plight unless they get politicians elected to local, state, and federal office. They will eventually begin fielding candidates for a third party movement known as the People's Party, which will represent the interest of American farmers. 
In a sense, by looking at the activities of labor union activists and populists, we're really looking at reform movements in the 19th century. And here's where we need to take a look at government reform. To begin, we'll start with the situation of city or municipal governments during the age. Take a look at the graph that I have here on the slide that shows the urban versus rural population of the United States from 1790 until 1990. You'll notice that early on in our nation's history, most people lived in rural areas because they practiced farming as a, a, a vocation. That changes significantly with industrialization. You start to see by the late 19th and early 20th century, we're now seeing more people living in urban areas or city areas versus the countryside because it is these urban areas in which the jobs are available. Cities are exploding in size during this period. As a result, city leaders have to hire on many more municipal employees. They need to hire people to work for the city as policemen, as firemen, as civil engineers. They need to hire companies to build uh, uh, fresh water drinking systems. With the creation of thousands of new government jobs, however, comes the creation of opportunities for corruption and bribery to set in. City jobs were often coveted by unemployed workers. It was a steady paycheck, something you didn't get in agriculture. You might even get some paid holiday time, again, something you never got as a farmer. You might be eligible for a pension system so that at one point you could retire from that job. So there was tremendous competition among applicants for these city jobs. How do you make your application stand out? You attach a $10 bill to it. In other words, you look for ways to bribe the hiring manager. Slip him a little bit of money, either that or you might mention that, well, my cousin already works on, you know, the Seattle police force. Surely he'd put in a good word for me. In other words, you might practice nepotism, which is using family or friend contacts to get you a job. And let's just say there were plenty of city officials who were willing to take those bribes or to bribe others to get more money for themselves. Boss Tweed is a good example of the rampant corruption that was taking place in New York City during the 1860s. William Marcy Tweed became known as Boss Tweed because he was basically running the Democratic Party apparatus out of New York City. He controlled behind the scenes, for example, the hiring and firing of countless judges, city officials. How did he control things? He had a lot of money behind him. He had a lot of influence. He was willing to not only take bribes, but to give bribes to others so that he could make more money off of winning lucrative building contracts. All told, an estimated 75 to $200 million were swindled from the city of New York between 1865 and 1871 by Tweed and his associates. Unfortunately, during the period, such graft and corruption could be found not just at the local level, but at the state and increasingly at the federal level. For instance, in Pennsylvania, it was well known that Standard Oil Corporation exerted tremendous influence over state legislators, whom the company regularly bribed. This spoil system, as it became known, also extended to federal jobs. We've already spoken, for instance, of the scandal surrounding U.S. Grant's presidencies. The same was true of his successor in the White House, Rutherford B. Hayes. In fact, Hayes was branded rather fraud by critics for his awarding of government jobs to Republican yes-men. Hayes' corruption did not go unnoticed by members of his own party, however. By the end of his term in office, as the 1880 election rolled around, the Republican Party was hotly debating the subject of civil service reform. Civil service reform refers to the push to clean up government office, to try and hire the best people for the job, not just the people who can lie, cheat, and steal to get that job. Remember, though, some people are benefiting quite a bit from getting bribed. There are some people who think the existing system, with all of its flaws, is perfect and that nothing needed to be changed. However, within the Republican Party, this issue will be divisive. There will be three main groups of Republican contenders for the presidential nomination in 1880. These three groups were the stalwarts, the half-breeds, and the mugwumps. This may sound like random trivia, but please bear with me. 
the Republican Party was divided. Uh, those who thought everything was great the way it was, these were people that were likely benefiting financially from the corruption, those that wanted everything to stay the same were known as stalwarts. Those Republicans that wanted some reform, they didn't want to go too far with it, but, you know, they thought this would look good to the electorate if we start to, to make some overtures in this direction. Those that wanted some civil service reform were known as half-breeds. The final faction within the Republican Party that are debating this issue of civil service reform were the mugwumps. The mugwumps were those that were strong supporters of civil service reform. They looked around and said, this system is broken. It's long overdue for a cleanup. So why did we take this little foray into the names of Republican factions? To begin with, because the Republican Party was so divided on this one issue, they had a hard time coming up with a candidate for the presidency in 1880. To appease those that were slightly in favor of reform, they will choose James Garfield as their nominee for the president in 1880. He's a half-breed, someone that wanted some change but not too much. In order to appease the conservative element in their party, though, those that were likely making the most from this situation of corruption, they chose Chester Arthur, who was a stalwart, as the vice presidential nominee. Despite such turmoil within the party, the Republicans managed to win the presidential contest of 1880, and Garfield took office amidst hopes that civil service reform would soon be put into effect. As it turned out, Garfield and his presidency were short-lived. Only four months after taking the oath of office, a man by the name of Charles Guiteau approached the president at the Washington, D.C. train station and opened fire. Garfield, severely wounded by a bullet to his back, died several months later from his injuries, leaving Chester Arthur to take over the reins of power. What could have led this unknown man to kill the President of the United States? Well, he was crazy. We already know that. He was actually a diagnosed schizophrenic. But besides his insanity, another clue lay in the words that the assassin uttered to police just moments after the incident. Guteau freely admitted that he had killed the president, but he proudly asserted that, quote, Arthur is president, and I am a stalwart. Now, remember who the stalwarts were? They were fellow members of Garfield's own Republican Party, right? They differed mainly in their refusal to reform the government. So it would seem that we lost a president because his assassin had tried to win office himself and, and failed, and so he thought, well, I'm going to kill this president so that we can make sure that there will be no civil service reform. If that sounds bonkers to you now in the 21st century, imagine how crazy that sounded to Americans when they read about it over their morning coffee at the time. As President Arthur took office, public sentiment was strongly in favor of ridding the government of this kind of greed and corruption that had generated such madness in recent months. This furor resulted in the passage of the Pendleton Act in 1883. This will establish a permanent civil service commission to oversee the hiring and firing of government employees. A new merit system would be implemented. Now, applicants had to pass an examination to demonstrate their professional qualifications for office. If you can't pass the test, you can't get this job. The emphasis moving forward was on trying to get qualified individuals in positions of power, rather than simply passing people through the system because they bribed someone. Recall, though, that Arthur was a stalwart. He was against civil service reform. Why would he support this legislation? Because the public wanted it. It would have been political suicide for Arthur to have said, you know what, let's not pass this piece of legislation. But let's be clear, Arthur did it more out of political expediency rather than out of any real commitment to reform. Nevertheless, the public was happy to see this development. 